Hello, and welcome to Military History Inside Out, brought to you by War Scholar. We talk about military history from ancient times to modern, and everything in between. I'm Chris Alvarez, and thank you for listening. I'm speaking with Dr. Stephen Woodworth, co-editor of Vicksburg Besieged, published by Southern Illinois University Press, June 11th, 2020. Thank you for speaking with me. My pleasure. So first, um, I, I think you've been involved with Civil War history uh, for some time, but uh, why did you create this uh, work about Vicksburg? Well, of course, this is part of a series. Um, we uh, now called, I think we call it the uh, Civil War Campaigns in the West series. Mm -hmm. And the reason was, uh, well, there's been several reasons, but, um, you know, the, as we know, the Eastern campaigns have been very heavily studied. And historically, uh, over the last century, the Western campaigns have not received as much attention. Now, they are now receiving. We're, we're catching up. Uh, the Western campaigns are, are being studied, and that's a great thing. There's several new works out on Shiloh, and there's some on Chickamauga and Chattanooga. Excellent work being done there. Mm -hmm. But I thought that there was an opening for this kind of book, that is, um, book that would be a collection of essays, and this genre, this type of book, provides opportunities that um, that are, would be harder to get in a, in a great big book. Now, so, like, let's say uh, Glenn Robertson's, you know, series that he's working on, on Chickamauga, there's going to be room for a lot of stuff in that. He's, uh, the first volume is out, I don't know if the second one is out yet. <laughs> But, uh, you know, he's got this whole volume just on, on the lead-up to the battle. So, yeah, he's got a lot of detail there. But what a book like this, like Vicksburg, because he does, of course, this is on Vicksburg. What this does, it allows scholars, uh, several different scholars, to pursue interesting angles of research that might not necessarily find their way into a larger book. They, uh, it just might be too much of a digression, mm -hmm. cul-de-sac to go down, but they're interesting, and they're informative, and they're significant, and so I thought um, that kind of book would be valuable on the Western campaign, so a number of years ago, Chuck Greer and I started this series, well, actually, Chuck wasn't wasn't in on the first volume, but he was kind of behind the scenes, and, and uh, I I think I edited the first volume or two myself, and then Chuck went ahead and came on board officially. And so we've been doing this on a number of different uh, campaigns. So then why Vicksburg? Well, Vicksburg is tremendously important to the Civil War, obviously. The control of the Mississippi River, the severing of the Confederacy, and just the fact that it was a major prolonged struggle. I think I can see similarities to the for example, in World War II, the struggle for Guadalcanal. By that, I mean just a struggle where both sides um, invest heavily in holding a key piece of terrain, and the struggle is protracted over a period of months. Now, not in this particular book. This book covers about six weeks. But the struggle for Vicksburg as a whole was something that went on from late 1862 up until the period covered by this book comes to an end, it's July 4th of 63. Mm -hmm. So I think that there is good reason for several books within the larger series to focus on aspects of the Vicksburg campaign. And this one focuses on the siege. And I think we bring out some interesting aspects of that. Mm -hmm. So just uh, stepping back a bit on a personal level, where did your interest in the Civil War start and how did it progress up to this point? Okay. Well, yeah, that, it becomes a personal story, and it goes way back uh, into the 1960s, actually, mm -hmm. as um, a boy. Um, this they, kind of an odd story, but I used to, I used to, bug, before I could read, I used to bug my dad to read to me, mm -hmm. and he would read to me. He was, he was good that way. That was a blessing that I had in my life. I had a father, actually a mother, but especially my father, who would just read to me a lot, and I bugged them to read to me, and they did, and. Of course, there was the usual kid stuff, Winnie the Pooh books and dinosaur books and so forth. But I think somewhere along the line, my dad find he found he was reading to me so much that he just decided maybe I would 
not mind listening to the same book that he was reading. And so he had quite a taste for um, for history. And he would read um, the works of Bruce Catton and uh, other other books on the Civil War, as well as other books on history, uh, Cornelius Ryan and Walter Lord and so forth. And so I got to have a taste for those books before I was able to read them myself. Later, when I did become a reader myself, I, I especially enjoyed the works of Catton, and I think most historians of my generation will tell you if you ask them, how did you get interested in the Civil War? Well, Catton. Mm-hmm. And so, um, devoured Catton, and of course there's Grant moves, well, Grant takes command, Grant moves south, uh, covering Grant, and all his campaigns, and notably including the Vicksburg campaign. So I became interested in the Civil War and uh, decided that I would uh, that I wanted to be a history professor. Uh, and my undergraduate uh, career at Southern Illinois University, I studied with John Simon, who was the editor of the Grant Papers, and uh, he tried to talk me out of going to grad school. He said, you're good, but you won't get a job. And... Uh, being a cocky young man, I'll get a job. A lot of other people won't get jobs, but I will. And of course, I had no idea how hard the the history job market was, the history teaching job market. And now I feel peculiarly blessed and and just to have a university teaching job. I often say that having gotten a job at a university teaching the Civil War, I feel as if I got in the last seat on the last lifeboat off the Titanic. Hmm. But uh, I got to do this, and this is a wonderful thing to be able to uh, teach, which I love, mm-hmm. and then also study history and write it. And so I write Civil War history. So, so that's the personal story of how I got here. Cool. Um, so back to the uh, the book then. What do the essays touch on? Okay. Well, there are eight essays in the book, and they, they cover different sorts of things. So uh, you know, Drew Bledsoe wrote on Grant and his staff. Um Scott Stabler and Martin Hershock on uh, African American troops in the Vicksburg campaign. That's a very uh, that, that's a good chapter. And then um, I really like Jonathan Sepley's chapter on. Uh, I actually I like them all. They're in my book. But uh, on uh, sharpshooters at the siege of Vicksburg. Mm-hmm. And of course, Jonathan is the author of uh, Fighting Means Killing. It came out in 2018 on how the Civil War soldiers dealt with killing. And one thing about being a sharpshooter was that. You know, sharpshooters aim at individuals. They, sometimes soldiers in the ranks do also, but a soldier in the rank might just deliver musketry, just point his rifle downrange and fire it. And so that, sharpshooters have to deal with the reality of killing much more so. My own chapter was on, uh, night action during the Vicksburg siege, which is really when the interesting stuff went on. In the daytime, not to say the daytime isn't interesting, but, uh, the night was much more fluid, much more unpredictable, and a wider range of different kind of activities might go on at night. Uh, Justin Solonik wrote on Andrew Hickenlooper and Vicksburg Mines, uh, especially the, uh, the first mine there, uh, Logan's Approach, and that uh, right there at the mine. So um, Hickenlooper's role in that, of course, as a volunteer engineer. He wasn't uh, trained at West Point as an military engineer, but... Uh, became quite effective at it. And then uh, John Gaines on uh, civilians in the Vicksburg campaign. Of course, there were a lot of civilians, obviously, inside the town of Vicksburg. They had to go through. And then Richard Holloway on uh, Louisianans uh, in the uh, relief effort. And Chuck Greer uh, wrote uh, on how trans-Mississippians in the Confederate forces viewed the fall of Vicksburg. Which is kind of interesting because uh, it's based on on his book, um, Why Texans Fought, and what he found in that book, and then he uh, expanded and developed further in this chapter was that uh, for many Texans and also Louisianans and Arkansans in the ranks of the Confederate armies serving east of Mississippi, where most of them did serve, the fall of Vicksburg really brought a change in morale because it uh, put the Mississippi River in Union control between them and their home folks. Mm. And at that point, you start to notice uh, not universal, but a much increased decline in morale, desire to get back 
to the home state, desire to for Texas, desire to get back to Texas, and you find what happens in, in many Texas units is after the fall of Vicksburg is a, a man would desert, make his way across the South alone, cross Mississippi River, get back to Texas, and then join a local unit there, defending against Indians on the frontier or defending against possible Yankee incursions to Texas. The point was not that he didn't want to fight, maybe. He maybe didn't see much future in fighting east of the Mississippi, and he didn't like fighting uh, cut off from his home country. Mm -hmm. So anyway, that was Chuck's chapter, and uh, there's eight of them, and I think that they explore some interesting the Vicksburg Siege. I'm speaking with Stephen Woodworth, co-editor of Vicksburg Besieged. You can find more information on the book at the Southern Illinois University Press website. If you like this podcast, Military History Inside Out, so far, please subscribe to it and rate it if you can. If you want more military history ranging from the ancient to the modern, please visit warscholar.org or militaryhistorypodcast.com to sign up for my weekly newsletter and keep up with my latest posts. You can also find written interviews and my social media links there. You can find the links to my other podcasts at fullcontactnerd.com and technologyinspace.com. And now back to the podcast. So a couple questions I have. One, having read the first two and a half uh, essays so far, I, I get the impression there's a lot of confusion on the Union side as far as how the, the campaign or the siege was run, you know, basically Grant's staff being a little sketchy as far as its capabilities and then uh, sort of the knowledge of the, the officers involved on the Union side. Yes, that is one of the major themes of the siege, the fact that the Army of the Tennessee, uh, it, well, of course, I've written on the Army of the Tennessee, uh, nothing but victory, and uh, I find it one of the things that's so interesting about the Army of the Tennessee is that it is the um, so it's the archetypical volunteer army in that the Army of the Potomac is going to soak up most of the trained um, engineers, the military engineers, mm. and. Um, the Army of the Tennessee has to use, um, first of all, as far as staff officers, sure, there are some West Point men, obviously. Grant is, Sherman is, McPherson is, and so forth. But as far as what an Army needs in order to to function as, an, as a field Army and then to wage a siege, which is the ultimate military engineering challenge for an Army, the Army of the Tennessee has to improvise. You know, it's the Army of Tennessee is the army that Grant makes. And I think one of the qualities that Grant has that is often overlooked was his ability to cultivate and mentor or at least set up a um, an army uh, culture, a, a uh, an atmosphere within the Army of the Tennessee that allowed talented uh, younger officers or, or talented officers to develop and to rise in the ranks. And certainly this shows up in the Vicksburg siege. You have a man like, um, well, like Andrew Hickenlooper, and goodness sakes, there was another one, and I've just gone blank. He's not especially dealt with in the book. Jenny, I think, was his last name, but it doesn't matter. But anyway, he actually later engineered one of the first uh, sort of proto-skyscrapers that we wouldn't count as a skyscraper today, but what was at that time dealt with as a skyscraper. William LeBaron and Jenny is what I want to say, but boy, it's been, it's been a while. But, you know, on the subject of guys who were not trained as military engineers, but they get here to Vicksburg and, hey, it's time to learn how to do this military engineering thing. On the other on the other end of the spectrum, the guys who who uh, don't show up with some civil engineering background, as Jenny and as Hickenlooper did, um, it is really a steep learning curve. And there's a, a neat story that I included in Nothing But Victory, uh, and, I, and I know Justin uh, Solonek included in his book, uh, Engineering Victory, uh, from which his, his chapter on Hickenlooper is sort of a further development. But anyway, there's a neat story about a, a brigade commander in the Army of the Tennessee. I forget which one. And he gets these orders, take your 
or maybe it's brigade or regiment anyway, uh, take your brigade, your regiment out and build some sap rollers or some uh, gabions or, you know, one of those uh, siege type things. Mm -hmm. And he marches the men out and he's much at a loss because he has no idea what these things are that he's supposed to build. And they happen to run into General Sherman and General Sherman says, you know, what are your orders? And he says, well, we're supposed to do, you know, make these gabions and these fascines and so forth. And Sherman, I think, must have picked up on the officer's discomfort, and he says, uh, are, are, you, do you, um, are you familiar with this process of making these things? Well, of course, the officer was not familiar on what these things even were. And so he says, sir, we're not too well posted on siege work. Our service thus far has been in the field, which is very true. And so Sherman, okay, Sherman gets off his horse, asks one of the men for an axe, and with his own hands, with the axe, you know, demonstrates, here's how you make a gabion, here's how you make a fascine, and showed them how to do it. And that was another thing that was necessary at this level. You had to teach them how to do it. The, the good news was, though, that the officer was bright and talented, and a lot of these guys, you know, think about the Army of the Tennessee, they are about one generation removed from the frontier. Mm. Their fathers, or at least their grandfathers, actually were carving farms out of the wilderness. So you had to be versatile. You had to be a quick study and uh, the kind of guy who can learn how to do it. This guy did. Well, that's how you make gabions. That's how you make fascines. And soon they were doing it. So they got up to speed quickly. Now, what's kind of interesting, I don't think it's brought out in this book, but uh, it was important that the Corps commander uh, be someone who had some military engineering training. Of course, McPherson, commander of the 17th Corps, was, I think, the top graduate in his class at West Point. He was an Army engineer uh, before the war. Sherman, uh, sixth in his class at West Point, artillery officer coming out of there, but, but high, of course, highly trained in engineering. Actually, would have made it into the Corps of Engineers, might have been first in his class if he'd been a little better behaved when he was in West Point. Then you've got McClernand, McClernand is not without talent on the battlefield, although he's a difficult general. He's not necessarily subordinate, and he's got a big go. But uh, he doesn't know military engineering, and it's interesting that the 13th Corps makes very little progress uh, siege-wise until uh, EOC Ord takes over to replace McClernand and, uh, and really... Is, is playing catch up the rest of the siege. It's the 15th Corps and especially the 17th Corps under McPherson that make the big progress during the siege. So you're right. Yes, this was new for them. They were learning, they were improvising, and I think the bottom line, the takeaway is they successfully learned and they successfully improvised and they got to be good at this. Hmm. Now this is, this is quite an aside from the book, but mm -hmm. it just struck me what if the United States had never established uh, West Point as a military college? You know, it makes me wonder how, you know, do you know of anyone who's written on this, the effects of, like, the development of it and, and how it's affected American history? Um, I, well, there have been a number of books written, and uh, I didn't, I sort of didn't prepare to answer that question. So, um, as far as calling the names of authors, I used to be able to rattle these off, and mm -hmm. uh, I guess so. Uh, old age is dulling the memory. But yeah, there are a number of books that have been written on the development of West Point as a school during the uh, during the period before the Civil War by a number, I think there may be three or four uh, at least. Uh, so um, yes, West Point played a huge role. And if the United States had never um, established West Point, uh, well, it would have been a lot different war. If you have to say we would not have been able to do siege warfare at all. Mm -hmm. I mean, that's that's not something... When I say siege warfare, and this is an important distinction, because your typical American you know, farmer or, or politician, John McClernand or whoever, when they think of siege warfare, they think of a siege as it would be in Indian warfare. I don't know if you're familiar with Starved Rock in Illinois, mm -hmm. uh, near Ottawa, Illinois, and, of course, many of the soldiers there at Vicksburg, they were familiar with the story of Starved Rock, and I think there were some 
Illini Indians who got surrounded up on top of Starve Rock by some another tribe and and they were starved out they eventually you know and that was how people looked at a seat well you know in indian warfare that's what it was you surround the place and if you can't do anything else you just stay around there until the guys inside get hungry and either give up or starve to death and of course there's there's sort of a common misconception that that's what the siege of vicksburg was well it's true that food did get a little bit short there Although they did have some, they were they were feeding them in short rations in order to uh, make the food last as long as possible. But they were not out of food, and they were not starving to death. They were on on decidedly short rations, going hungry and not liking it. But the reason that Pemberton surrendered when he did was that the Union siege operations. By that I mean what the soldiers of that era, and I'm sure you're familiar, would call regular approaches. So uh, sapping and mining, getting up close. And by the time the siege ends, in most sectors of the 15th and 17th Corps, and maybe a little bit less so the 13th, Union siege positions are within uh, it's 25, 30 yards of the Confederate parapet. And they're almost, uh, they're, they're practically adjacent to each other. So... Pemberton realized that he would not be able to repel a full-scale Union assault. That's all to say, that's all a matter of regular approaches of actual siege work, and that was something that was taught at West Point. Hmm. No West Point, very unlikely that anybody knows how to do that, to teach the other people. There's no General Sherman to show this regimental commander, here's how you do this. And... uh, so it, it would have been different, a lot of a lot of episodes. And, of course, that wouldn't have been the only difference, not just siege work, but uh, in many ways. And I, I think you'd have to say with no West Point, the Confederacy probably wins, despite the fact that many, you know, many West Point trained officers like Robert E. Lee and John C. Pemberton went over to the Confederacy. I think that um, it just would have been so difficult to carry on offensive operations without trained military men. Hmm. But that's a counterfactual, so it's kind of hard to say for sure. Right. So the 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 siege was it meant to develop uh, trenches and such to get troops close enough so that they didn't have to go across dangerous ground to get to the enemy, or was it to get past obstacles that were in the way of getting the the troops close? It could be both, but especially the the former, especially uh, getting. Uh, closer so that you could uh, attack effectively. There was a French general by the name of Vauban, you may be familiar with him, a couple of centuries earlier, and he really was the, sort of the founding father of siege warfare, of regular approaches. And he designed a lot of forts, and, and actually some of the forts he designed, somewhat updated, were still holding their own in World War One against the Germans, but but he decided, here's how a fort should be, and here's how you should lay it out, here's where it should have field of uh, fields of fire, and here's where it should be visible to the enemy or not, so forth. And then he said, but to take a fort, the enemy's fort, here's what you need to do. And it becomes kind of like, um, like chess, uh, when you're playing a certain line in chess. Oh, okay, this guy is playing the... Uh, you know, he's using the Sicilian opening, and so I'm going to I'm going to use the King's Indian defense or whatever. You know, <laughs> you have certain lines that you play, and it's kind of became that way in siege warfare. It was one of the reasons that, for example, George McClellan loved siege, siege warfare because it was so predictable. It was you you did certain predictable things. If he moves this, then you need to move that, and then that will take this away from him. And in a way, to keep the chess analogy going, you think of an end game where you've got a king and a pawn and the other guy only has a king. And if you know what you're doing, you can methodically work it down to he loses. Uh, if you don't, <laughs> it can go on forever and it becomes a stalemate. And that's kind of how siege warfare was. Vauban worked it out. Military engineers studied it. You know, the École Polytechnique in Paris and then uh, that information you know, comes over and is taught at West Point as military engineering and siegecraft. If he's in a, if he's in a fortress, 
no matter how well it's con- constructed, even if it's well laid out to the best uh, the best principles, the besieging army will always win. It's like the end game in chess. You make these moves, and you can methodically work your way closer by the zigzag trenches until you get up to it. And then it is it becomes then a matter of not crossing deadly ground and of removing obstacles. Not crossing deadly ground, i.e., you're now 30 yards away, maybe 10 yards away, and people are not going to have very long to shoot at your people when they charge. Secondly, removing obstacles. If possible, you'd like to make a breach in his in his parapet, in his uh, breastworks. Uh, some breastworks can be breached with artillery, and so you, you know, plant your siege uh, batteries and you breach his breastworks. And some uh, breastworks have to be breached w- uh, by mining, which was done at Vicksburg. And, of course, that's what uh, chapter... Uh, Justin Solonik's chapter on Hickenlooper deals with in particular is uh, mining under the uh, breastworks, blowing them up, and then creating a breach, which hopefully you can charge through. Mm -hmm. So to ask my second question, which unfortunately kind of flirts with the counterfactual as well, um, which is, uh, you know, the idea that foreign powers, European powers, were considering intervening on the side of the South. Would Vicksburg have been a good spot for them to intervene to perhaps um, achieve Southern victory? Is Vicksburg, uh, well, that's the question. Yeah, well, counterfactuals are fun, uh, and we just have to remember that they are counterfactuals, so we'll never totally know. Hmm. Um, but, uh, yes, would that have been a good place? Well, there would have been problems for any foreign power. I mean, France was willing they didn't want to do it without Britain. Britain was sorely tempted, but they ultimately decided not to. What if, let's say Britain, because France isn't going to do it by themselves, so we have to say Britain. So they've got a great big navy. Their navy is more powerful than ours on the open sea. But could the British navy force its way up the Mississippi River? Hmm. Maybe. Maybe, but... If the United States Navy is going to have a chance to um, to contend against the British Navy, if, if where we would be at most advantage would be in shallow water, so that's the Mississippi. Um, in deep water, out on blue water, the British Navy is going to win every time. It's not going to be close in a fleet action, mm. but possibly in a coastal type action, uh, the U.S. Navy might have been able to hold its own. If the British had wanted to intervene. Of course, there were places where they could get more bang for their buck or, or more bang for their pound, I guess. And that would be uh, on the East Coast, probably threatening Washington or New York, where you've got extremely sensitive U.S. targets, very close to deep water, uh, very close to the coast, and the British would not have had to have had a long supply line. Of course, the British have previous experience at trying to take New Orleans, it had not worked out well for them, mm-hmm. and I suspect uh, they would have been leery, and rightly so, about trying to force their way that far into the interior up the Mississippi River and say, well, wouldn't they have a friendly countryside around them? Yeah, they would. So that might change the equation a little bit. But I think that if I am, if um, we're in this counterfactual scenario, uh, some kind of simulation game or something that we're playing out. In the counterfactual scenario, Britain intervenes uh, as of May of 63. If I'm the British player, I'm going to play towards the East Coast where my supply lines are shorter, closer to Canada, uh, my deep water Navy can have a more direct impact, and wh- whatever troops I put ashore will not have to penetrate quite as deeply into what is at least a, a little bit of an unknown and um, wild and woolly back country. Mm-hmm. So did, did the South, did the Confederacy commit enough resources for the protection of Vicksburg considering its worth or were they just split too thinly um, to do much better than they had? Mm-hmm. That's a really good question because uh, there, there is certainly is a um, an element of just they just didn't have the resources. 
Well, and and so how would I answer that? Because it, you really, it's a yes and no, or a yes and yes, like yes to the first and yes to the second. What I would say is the Confederacy could have just tried to survive as long as possible, which in a way it did try to survive as long as possible, and, and maybe it really did survive that long. But, you know, if just survival was the thing, then then you would have to say that a division or two should have been pulled away from Lee's army and should have reinforced uh, Confederate forces in Mississippi, which was actually, of course, considered back in May of six in May of sixty three, uh, and there were a couple of conferences in Richmond, and Davis was one to hold long conferences, talk a lot, and they really considered should one or more divisions perhaps a whole core of the Army of Northern Virginia, be detached and sent out to Mississippi to try to remedy the situation there. And I think if the Confederate strategy was simply stay alive, you know, uh, staying alive as long as you can, then that would probably be wisest, just strategically. But then you have to factor into the, the equation other uh, items. For example, personnel. When Lee was asked, Robert E. Lee was asked about, you know, hey, what about sending troops out there? And Lee, um, because Lee was asked this, Davis asked Lee several times during the war, what about sending troops out west? And one thing Lee was Lee mentioned was the uncertainty of their employment in the west. And if you've got a couple of divisions of troops, now I, I know Joseph Johnston has his defenders, but do you want, you know, do you want Joseph Johnston directing? your couple of divisions, or Robert E. Lee. Well, I think most military historians would say you're probably better off letting Lee uh, take the troops. So again, to go back to the idea, since counterfactual, think of a, you know, we're playing a, a Civil War simulation game, and I'm the Confederate player. Now, admittedly, I have hindsight of what really did happen, so I know that Jefferson Davis didn't know. But I think what I would do is... Uh, those 30,000 men that Joseph Johnston had in Jackson as his army of relief, nah, I wouldn't put that there. Uh, as far as I could, if I could get those guys on railroads, of course, some of them came from places like South Carolina and so forth. I'm going to load them all up. I'm going to get them all up, at least into northern Virginia. You may recall that during the Gettysburg campaign, we wanted Beauregard personally, to be brought up from South Carolina to command at least a dummy army, something, I guess, similar to what George Patton performed in the weeks leading up to D-Day in, in World War II, where Patton is basically in, there in southern England with a staff making noises, figuratively speaking, uh, sending radio messages, as though he had a big army there and was going to cross over and land at pas de calais gets the Germans' attention. And, and Lee, I think, foresaw, um, obviously he really didn't know anything about that because it hadn't happened yet, but Lee was thinking in the same kind of terms, get Beauregard in northern Virginia with at least a token force and let him threaten Washington so as to weaken the Army of the Potomac for whatever Lee can manage to pull off in Pennsylvania at that time. Well, I would say if I'm the Confederate player in this simulations game, I'm going to strengthen Lee all I can. Pickett's division is going to have its other two brigades that are kept back in uh, in Virginia, if I'm the Confederate player. So if Pickett has to charge on July 30th, he's going to do it with five brigades instead of three. And I'm also going to have uh, Beauregard in northern Virginia with as many troops as I can possibly get to him. So, uh, again, Johnston's 30,000 men in Jackson as many of those men as possible are going to be either with Beauregard in Northern Virginia directly threatening Washington, or if I can get some of those people to Lee in Southern Pennsylvania, I'm going to put all my money on that throw of the dice. And now say, yeah, but if you lose, you lose. I know they lose anyway. So that's what I would do. I'd bet on Lee and put all my money on, on that, uh, on that role. Hmm. Interesting. I'm speaking with Stephen Woodworth, co-editor of Vicksburg Besieged. You can find more information on the book at the Southern Illinois University Press website. If you like this podcast, Military History Inside Out, so far, please subscribe to it and rate it if you can.
If you want more military history ranging from the ancient to the modern, please visit warscholar.org or militaryhistorypodcast.com to sign up for my weekly newsletter and keep up with my latest posts. You can also find written interviews and my social media links there. You can find the links to my other podcasts at fullcontactnerd.com and technologyinspace.com. Now back to the podcast. So the essay, so just to turn to the essays in the book, the um, mm-hmm. the one on the U.S. colored troops was really fascinating um, mm-hmm. as far as talking about stuff I'd never heard about before in detail. And then General, what is it, Lorenzo? I forget his name. Um, Lorenzo Thomas? His, his efforts were really interesting as far as the development yeah. of the U.S. colored troops. Right. And it's interesting that... Um, you know, Grant who sometimes gets criticized for not being anti-slavery enough. In fact, Grant is a very enthusiastic convert to Lincoln's well, convert completely. Grant was always anti-slavery. Mm-hmm. Um, he, Grant was raised, uh, his father was an abolitionist, and uh, Grant sometimes had a, uh, a kind of a iffy relationship with his father, and he of course, married a, a woman who came from a slaveholding family, but mm-hmm. r- right before the war, shortly before the war, a couple years before the war, the only slave that ever actually came into Grant's possession, it became his property, he immediately freed, and that was at a time when he could have sold that slave for maybe a thousand dollars, and that would have, he was very hard up for money at that time, mm-hmm. and really struggling financially, a thousand dollars was a lot of money back then. And, uh, I mean, it was like the price, it'd be like the price of a, of a nice car today or maybe a house and grant, um, freedom voluntarily. So Grant had always been against slavery, I mean, since before the war. And Grant enthusiastically backs Lorenzo Thomas's sort of anti, sort of emancipation speaking tour to the Army of the Tennessee during the months preceding the Vicksburg sieges. Thomas goes down there and speaks within the Army of the Tennessee, how we need to recruit black troops. And it's it's uh, interesting to see the attitudes of the members of that army change. I mean, there's John Logan, who uh, before the war had been derisively nicknamed by Illinois Republicans. Logan was a re- Illinois Democratic state representative from Murfreesboro, Illinois, deep in Little Egypt in Southern Illinois. Little Egypt's the nickname for Southern Illinois. And Logan had been derisively nicknamed Dirty Work Logan because he had uh, spoken out in Illinois and in Congress for the importance of enforcing the Fugitive Slave Act, that it's dirty work, but we've got to do the dirty work and we've got to you know, return fugitive slaves. And it actually, when the war started, not everybody in Southern Illinois was, was quite sure which way John Logan was going to go. Hmm. And he had a brother-in-law who actually did go down and join a Tennessee regiment. But Logan went with the Union. So here's this guy with this rather pro-slavery background. Here he is, you know, Lorenzo Thomas comes down and makes a speech, and then John Logan afterward is, is making his, you know, speech, seconding what Lorenzo Thomas is saying and supporting it and saying, yes, we need to do this and we need to have black troops. And what a transformation from just two or three years before. Mm -hmm. And not just in a guy like Logan, but I think of uh, a sergeant in Illinois regiment, a guy named Andrus, and uh, his letters have been published. And I can't remember whether uh, Scott and Martin used any only Andrus quotes, but he had been writing to his wife, you know, we don't need any, using language that I won't repeat, we don't need to, uh, any black soldiers in this army. We, don't, we shouldn't have any black soldiers. And then, you know, by, by this time in the war, he's writing his wife, well, you know, they're, they're raising black regiments, and I'm just a sergeant, but, you know, I might uh, be able to get an officer's commission in the black regiment. And he, it's like, whoa, he's, he's open to that. So there were some real changing attitudes, and sometimes it was a matter of self-interest, Sometimes it was, you know, and of course, a lot of times self-interest leads to a change of heart. You know, mm-hmm. think, yeah, I could be an officer of a black regiment, and you know what? Actually, these blacks are good soldiers. 
So, yeah, it was a, a time of transition. And I think one thing that makes uh, Scott's and Martin's essay so interesting is that this is where the transition was happening at this transitional time more than almost anywhere else. You've got the Mississippi Valley full of slaves, some of the densest slave population in America, mm-hmm. uh, among the densest. And so there are blacks, freed slaves, freedmen to be recruited. And you've also got this army, the Army of the Tennessee, which was, for the most part, not made up of abolitionists. Sure, some of the Wisconsin regiments and and others, you know, from northern, very much northern parts of Ohio and Illinois, they were very much anti-slavery. But most of the guys in that army had been either indifferent or hostile to abolitionism before the war. Mm -hmm. And now they're coming around. And that's really interesting. Well, another aspect of that essay, um, and if I'm remembering it correctly, was that the Union gave former slaves uh, the responsibility for running captured plantations um, for them. And, you know, obviously that infuriated the Confederates. But uh, Mm -hmm. that aspect that you had freed slaves given, you know, managerial uh, responsibility, basically. Um, logistical responsibility to some extent. That that was really fascinating. Right, right. You know, you've got over the whole thing, uh, Grant uh, Grant assigned Chaplain Eaton, uh, a chaplain actually, to oversee the the whole effort. And then on individual plantations, and and you have uh, yes, the the former slaves now are running the thing. And uh, I think uh, maybe what made the uh, Confederates the angriest was the fact that it worked well. They turned out to be able to do it, be able to do it. As for remembering the chapter, uh, you've actually read it more recently than I have because I read it in manuscript when we were putting the book together. And, of course, as you know, books like this are, are in uh, process for about a year. Or so uh, you've read it at least a year and a half more recently than I have. <laughs> yeah. So let me turn to uh, actually putting the book together. Um how do you, what's the process of, of reviewing the essays, you know, fact checking, that sort of thing? I know the, the people who've written the essays are experts in their field, but how do you go about that? Mm-hmm. Well, the essays have to run many gauntlets before they see the, uh, you know, they show up on the printed page in the book. So in this case, you know, Chuck and I are both editing it. We both read all the chapters. And uh, so we run, it goes by our eyes and we look for things that, that right? You know, and sometimes you, you read something, you say, is that really right? And you look it up and uh, find out, oh, that's really true. Or somebody's going, well, you know, guys, uh, you might want to go back and check this, or uh, do you have a source for this, or whatever. And we, we work through all that stuff, so they have to get, get by the two of us. Then, of course, this is a peer-reviewed book, so it goes off to uh, the press. I would, I would imagine uh, the acquisitions editor at SIU Press, uh, Sylvia, Rodrigue uh, gives it a once over, and then it's going to go though to um, the scholarly readers, the peer review process. And uh, usually, we don't know who those people are, but two scholars are chosen by the press, who who also have uh, strong reputations in this area and strong background in studying this area. They're going to read over it, and they can make criticisms, and, uh, and nobody's going to know. Um, you know, who they were. So it's it's their chance to to have a go at this manuscript and without, uh, without, without us, you know, knowing who who it was. I don't know who it was. Chuck doesn't know. And the authors don't. So they'll make criticism and say, well, you know, why did you bring out this? Or, you know, are you sure you, this is right? Or they'll say, hey, you know, you should see this source because this is otherwise. So they also will catch errors and Sometimes we, a manuscript will get kicked back and forth. I don't know that this one, we went through much difficulty. I think it was relatively smooth sailing. Everyone did a good job. But uh, sometimes we'll have to, uh, you know, it goes back to the author, and the author will do some rewriting, rechecking, and we go back to the scholarly readers, hey, is this okay? And, you know, well, no, I still think you need to work more on this. At some point, uh, and I can say this one, I think, was relatively uh, a relatively easy process for us. I, Chuck and I, of course, we we start we send it back to the author. Hey, you know, rework this. You need to look at that, so forth. And we did a little of that. By the 
time we got to the scholarly readers, I think uh, we sailed through uh, relatively unscathed. Uh, at least I don't remember a lot of difficulty. And so the point is that each one of these chapters has uh, been reviewed by at least four PhDs who specialize in the Civil War. That would be Chuck Greer, myself, and the two anonymous uh, scholarly readers. Mm -hmm. uh, by the time it sees the light of day. Mm -hmm. What, uh, among the essays, uh, what, and maybe including yours, uh, what was the most surprising uh, fact you came across or learned? Hmm. Well, surprising. Well, I don't know that, that to me there were any surprises in it. You know, there are a number of things that were, that were interesting, and like we mentioned, uh, you know, the, the African-American troops, but I had, I had encountered some of that in working with um, the Army of the Tennessee. It was interesting to see it developed more. So it's like, well, that's maybe not surprising, but hmm, interesting. Yeah, well, that's even more than I thought, that kind of thing. Mm -hmm. Again, with, with all of them, I would say I didn't find surprises, but I certainly found interesting stuff, mm -hmm. things that I knew somewhat in that direction, and the chapter developed it more. So in regards to Vicksburg, and not necessarily in regards to any of the essays, uh, what, what, is the, um, what have you found to be the most difficult question to answer, either something that maybe you've finally come to a conclusion with or you still would like to know what's going on? Mm -hmm. That's a good question. Well, in a way, there's why didn't Joseph Johnston attempt to relieve Vicksburg? You know, I think I know the time just never seemed right until all the time was gone. But it seemed like some effort at relief ought to have been made. I don't think he could have done it. Mm -hmm. But from his point of view, from the Confederate point of view, and Jefferson Davis brought this out, we, we've got to try to relieve Vicksburg. We can't just sit here and let them take that stronghold from us. So that's one thing that has perplexed me over the years. Mm -hmm. So apart from adding to the historical record, what else do you hope this particular book will do for understanding Vicksburg? Well, I think it fills the gap in the historical record in a particular way, in that um, even a, a multi-volume book like Ed Barr's multi-volume Vicksburg or... Um, Whatever other book that passes by these things, say it's going to touch on, as my Nothing But Victory, uh, History of the Army of Tennessee, does touch on uh, the recruitment of black troops, Lorenzo Thomas's visit to the Army of the Tennessee. It can't really open that up and explore that specific topic as deeply as you can in a chapter in a book like this. Hmm. Or... You know, Justin Solonik, you know, he can touch on Andrew Hickenlooper and the mine in his book, Engineering Victory, you know, uh, the, the um, military engineering side of the Vicksburg siege. But this chapter gives him the opportunity to develop it more with respect to Andrew Hickenlooper, this uh, civil engineer with no military engineering background, and how he actually becomes very successful. So the idea that here are, there are interesting, it's its like you're going along uh, a path and here are some interesting stuff. I like to hike in the mountains and in the woods. And, and so uh, sometimes, you know, here's an interesting side path and it goes off here and, and maybe there's the, something to see over there. That interesting side path and it looks interesting, like a, something in a Robert Frost poem. Mm -hmm. But, uh, you know, you're, you're, you've got your... 15 mile hike or whatever you're trying to do that day. Now, 15 miles is a little long for me anymore nowadays. But um, anyway, you've got your miles that you're wanting to cover that day, and you, you have to test on. You can't explore the side trails as much as you'd like to. Huh. Even so, in a larger book on a topic like Vicksburg, this allows us to explore some of those side trails and reveal some interesting stuff. Mm -hmm. I actually want to touch on the final essay about um, sort of impressions after the fall of Vicksburg, and I didn't read that essay, so maybe the essay talks about this, but how strong, how demoralizing for the Confederacy was the loss of Vicksburg? Obviously, any big loss is, but did this one feel like that was the end of the effort, even though they continued on for, for a couple of years? 
Well, it depended who you were. To some Confederates, it definitely did. And to many Confederate troops, uh, as uh, Chuck writes about in that last essay, Confederate troops who were from states like Texas and Louisiana and Arkansas, um, not necessarily all of them, but to a significant number of them, this really felt like either the end or at least the end of their willingness to go on fighting in places like Virginia and Tennessee. Now, that's, of course, you know, that the, there continued to be Texas troops and other trans-Mississippi troops in the Army, Confederate Army of Tennessee and the Confederate Army of Northern Virginia, right to the end of the war. And some of them surrendered there with the um, with those armies. But the, the rate of desertion accelerated. So that becomes a factor, too. My take on Confederate soldiers' morale is that uh, it makes a big difference in Confederate soldiers' morale when they feel like Union forces are are either in their home country, in their home county, or between them and their home county. So for troops in the Trans-Mississippi, the presence, Union control of the Mississippi gives them the feeling the enemy is now between me and my hometown, my family, and so forth. And that has a great demoralizing effect on them. On the other hand, Confederate troops from Virginia, in a Virginia regiment, probably it would have relatively little impact, if any. Yeah. And it, as you speak, I'm just wondering, you know, as a Confederate, if you know that Vicksburg is now, you know, Union troops are marching through and really they're the law of that city, you know, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. The, the emotional pressure must be exceedingly high to not just go home to care for your loved ones. Uh, right. You, you, there is a strong desire to, to be at home. You know, I wrote a book on the 8th Georgia Regiment that contained counties from all over the state, and you can see the same phenomenon going on there. Um, desertion in the 8th Georgia was highest. In fact, I think there's, there's almost a direct linear correlation. The longer time Union units stay in a company's home county, the more soldiers from that company will desert. Now, they don't all desert. The majority don't desert. But uh, if, if Sherman's Army is in your home county for three days, they'll have some desertion. If Sherman's uh, Army in somebody like Rome, Georgia, one of the companies from, was from Rome, and for months, that's under Union occupation. Union troops are the law there, as you say. Then that company has one of the highest desertion rates in the state. And it was a high morale company before that. But knowing that the Yankees are in my hometown, my home county, tends to make them desert. And some of the, count, the companies in the East Georgia that whose home counties never felt the tread of a Yankee boot had no desertions at all. The interesting thing, from the 8th Georgia, from that point of view, is that from where they were, there was really little hope of going home and taking care of the family. There was a realization, well, you can't. We couldn't keep the Yankees out of uh, Floyd County, Georgia, fighting as an army. I'm not going to be able to do it individually. And what these guys did basically said, it's over. And, and they went and into Union lines, and they took the oath, and they set out the war north of the Ohio River. And I don't know, in the case of Vicksburg, I think I don't recall it. Chuck found that many doing that. What the Texans seemed to want to do is they wanted to get back to Texas. So it was, uh, I think the difference there is um, it's not the Yankees are in Texas. They control my home county. In that case, I'm not going to be able to do anything. It's that they're between me and my home county, and I want to get between the Yankees and my home county and, and be able to defend still. Uh, I want to be part of a unit that is actually defending Texas or Arkansas or Louisiana, as the case may be, against Union advance. So I think that's a difference here. But yeah, from the point of view of Vicksburg, if you are a Mississippi soldier and Vicksburg is your uh, your home, I would suspect, from what I've seen of other, I haven't, uh, I don't recall. Well, Chuck, he didn't handle uh, Mississippi troops because he was dealing with Trans Mississippi troops. But mm -hmm. from what I know of, of elsewhere in the war. I would expect those troops to become rather demoralized, and you would start to see a trickle of troops deserting, coming into Union lines, giving themselves up, and taking the oath. Hmm. Yeah. So, to ask, uh, so to take sort of a modern concept, did do you know if in Vicksburg or maybe other parts like in Georgia that you studied, did the did the Union use any kind of 
psychological warfare as far as, you know, trying to convince Confederate troops, you know, you should go home and protect your loved ones. It, you know, but I don't know if they used pamphlets or any, any kind of messaging like that. Did you see that? I'm not aware of a use of pamphlets or anything like, you know, would be ha in World War II, you know, dropping pamphlets uh, out of airplanes or anything like that, you know, or distributing them any other way, obviously, in the Civil War. Right. I'm not aware of that, but certainly much that the Union did was aimed with the goal of convincing Southerners that they should stop fighting this war, mm -hmm. whether it be Lincoln with his 10% plan and a you know, relatively, we'll let you up easy. You know, if you will stop fighting, we, we can make it easier on you kind of approach. And then later, the following year, you've got Sherman mm -hmm. in Georgia. I can make this march and make Georgia howl. And Sherman actually does open negotiations with Governor Brown of Georgia. You know, if you would pull Georgia troops out of the war, we will march through and we won't touch anything. We won't, we'll, we'll pay for whatever we take. And, you know, we'll, in other words, we'll treat Georgia like a friendly countryside rather than an enemy countryside. Mm -hmm. And Governor Brown didn't go for it. But so, yeah, there was certainly a view to convincing the other side that it would be better not to fight. Now, private soldiers, well, I think the Union policy that, hey, if you come into lines and you take the oath of allegiance, we'll turn you loose north of the, the Ohio. That was certainly a policy aimed at at persuading Southern soldiers to make their own private peace with the Union. And Southern soldiers knew about it. So I'm, I don't know of any pamphlet distribution, but somehow they knew it. Did I wonder if, uh, was the Union using newspapers to get, I, I would guess they would use newspapers to say, hey, you know, put this out there. And, you know, the South certainly had, uh, the, despite lack of resources, the South still had, was producing newspapers and such, weren't they? Well, the South did have newspapers. Of course, famously in Vicksburg, uh, some of the last issues of the Vicksburg paper were printed on wallpaper. Hmm. Uh, of course, the Southern newspapers are very much going to print. Uh, they're going to try to encourage the troops to go on fighting. Right. Yeah. Newspapers do change hands, though. There's a lot of fraternization, and I think, partially, you know, and fraternization may be the answer, which, uh, which in my chapter went on at night during the Vicksburg siege. Mm -hmm. So you have times where soldiers are chatting it up on friendly terms. And you'll, you know, the sort of famous uh, trading tobacco for coffee type thing and mm -hmm. uh, what have you. That went on at night during the Vicksburg siege. Now, it could give way rather suddenly and disturbingly to actual shooting, mm -hmm. which is a weird thing about fraternization and warfare. But we're kind of familiar with the idea of fraternization within the war, especially since the two sides uh, spoke more or less the same language. Mm -hmm. And I think the sharpshooter chapter even discusses um, how pickets from both sides would kind of get together at night, you know, and just kind of be buds in a sense, you know, at least briefly. Right. Um, and then try to shoot each other the next day. Strange thing. Yeah. Yeah. Hey, you're just doing a job, right? <laughs> right. What's your uh, current uh, or next writing project or editing project? We have some of both going on. We're working on uh, uh, an editing project, uh, Chuck and I, on uh, the Fort Henry and Fort Donaldson campaign. That'll be the next one in the series. Mm -hmm. And then uh, I'm actually working on a book on uh, Grant and the Virginia campaigns of 1864 and 65. And it's coming along slowly, but mm -hmm. working at it. Okay. Uh, where can uh, people find you online? Do you have social media, website? Well, I'm not, you know, I don't really represent myself professionally online, but they can certainly uh, find my books on Amazon and, uh, you know, they can find out about the series on uh, the website of Southern Illinois University Press. Mm -hmm. Okay. All right. Well, that's all the questions I have. Do you have any final thoughts or words? Not really. I love, I love, uh, reading and writing about the Civil War and talking about it, too, and this has been fun. I have, a, I have a suspicion that you do some war gaming as well, or was that... Boy, I have. It's been many, many years. <laughs> All right. Yeah. All right. Well, thank you so much for speaking with me. Well, thanks. My pleasure. Thank you for listening. If you like this podcast, Military History Inside Out, please subscribe to it and rate it if you can. If you want more military history ranging from the ancient to the modern, 
please visit warscholar.org or militaryhistorypodcast.com to sign up for my weekly newsletter and keep track of my latest posts. You can also find written interviews and my social media links there. Thanks for listening.